The Federal Reserve decided in 2009 that they would fully support the financial markets at all costs. There would never be another recession under their watch. They would utilize everything in their power to prevent potential losses. Well, in doing so, they started a trend. Every central bank is now following in the footsteps of the Fed onto the complete destruction of currencies worldwide. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we're going to look at what the Fed and the US government have done. Let's begin. The Great Recession is a speck in the rearview mirror for America's financial markets. They've advanced far beyond pre-crisis levels. In fact, everyone's favorite, Goldman Sachs, says you can go back a century before 2008 and still not find a bull market in everything like today's. So if you look at all the different sectors, you will find that the majority of them have risen since 2009. One of those sectors that hasn't seen the gains has been precious metals and in general commodities. You look around, you see practically all markets. They've been rising and rising and rising. They have seen the benefits of this Fed induced bubble that we are seeing appearing everywhere. It's becoming so pervasive. And in fact, it's becoming a global issue as well. You are seeing these bubbles appearing in different sectors where too much money is flowing into one sector and it is really causing a big problem. As a result, the government needs to step in. They should anyway, and try to slow it down. This is particularly evident with the uh, real estate market. And at this time, you're not seeing that in the financial markets quite as much because the margin is so high. And that's one of the things that really should be the very first thing to cool down on. But they generally don't do that and they let people uh, lose their shirts. So we'll see what happens with that. I'm going to show you a series of charts that are very important to me. Stocks versus paychecks. Stocks have skyrocketed since early 2009, while wages have inched higher. And actually, when you look in real terms, I've shown you before, that's not the case. They haven't gone higher at all. They've actually gone down. But let's take it for what it is. Nominal terms here. Okay. Financial crisis comes. It's right here at this level and approaches... 20. All right. Looking at this, Dow Jones, same time frame, and you notice clearly what has happened. Equity markets have seen a rise throughout these years since the financial crisis hit, and then you had the Federal Reserve coming in, printing up money, the SNB the Bank of Norway, all around the world, in fact, central banks buying up shares in U.S. markets, pushing the prices up. I've gone over it a thousand times. This shows you what I worry about. And that is the average individual. They're never directly invested. I'm talking about the average person, right? Maybe they have a pension fund. Maybe they have some sort of retirement account with their place they work at. But a lot of them don't necessarily buy a stock. Okay, They might have mutual funds, if anything. Usually it's some sort of retirement account that's locked away until they're 65. And sometimes they try to defer that until they're 71, depending on the area you live in, different rules. But the average person, they're not even invested in it. So what we see here is a lot of people, their lives are affected by it in many ways. So they have to give in to their, in Canada, they have the CPP, you know, you have your 401ks, different pension plans with the government that you don't have a choice. You can't opt out. So money comes off your paycheck, it goes into a fund, and you hope it's there for you when you retire. That's part of the whole cycle that, 
you know, we can push these markets up higher if we just take everybody's paycheck, take a percentage out, and we'll put it into the markets. We'll gamble on it in, in terms of margin. We'll be able to push it even higher. And then, of course, times get tough. Things come down. And you find out the truth about how unfunded these pensions really are. Okay. But we encounter something that's very interesting. And that is the average person, their wage doesn't keep up with asset prices. This is a big problem. Look, for stocks, it's one thing because you choose to invest in those stocks and that percentage just coming off your paycheck, you don't see it anyway. But everybody has to live somewhere. You need to buy a house. You need to buy food. You need to buy your electricity and so on. You have expenses and those continue to rise. Your wages don't keep up. And I continuously prove this all the time. And the only response I've ever received is a nonsensical, opinionated meme repeated over and over again. Stocks are rising. I'm talking about the average person, okay? What makes up the general population, all right? I'm saying, look at their wages. They're not keeping up. They can't afford this. They can't afford that. And all I keep hearing over and over again is stocks are rising. I realize that stocks are rising. I realize the Fed and other central banks around the world have been printing money, pushing up stocks. I have said countless times that stocks will continue to rise as long as the central banks are printing currency. Because the devaluation of the currencies, that results in this to go higher. I'm fully aware of that. I'm fully aware of what's happening and I've been covering it for many years but I'm talking about the average Joe. The average Joe isn't concerned about that. The average Joe is worried about keeping his lights on, keeping his family fed, and being able to support you know, the whole situation. I know that there will be comments down below that tell me that stocks have been rising and I'm a fear monger. But I'm, <laughs> I'm really just... It's, it's strange. Honestly, it's strange. Still playing catch-up, households across the board enjoyed strong income gains in the 1990s, but earnings for the poorest took a much steeper fall in the years that followed. Looking on the left-hand side, lowest fifth mean income in 2016 dollars. So we had this rise that occurred decades where there was just this rise in the average person's income. It's great. It's very beneficial because the more people are making, maybe they're able to buy a second car, maybe they're able to do a little renovation on their home, maybe they can go and spend a little money into the economy, Some go see some shows, go see some uh, movies and restaurants and everything else, okay? They're spending into that. However, in real terms, that changed. There was a big change. And that took place after the year 2000. Something happened behind the scenes in the year 2000, very, very strange occurrence. I still haven't been able to pinpoint exactly what it was, but it might be several factors. And I've looked at literally thousands of charts to show this. I've read into it and I've really been trying to understand what happened. Yes, we know that there was a tech boom and bust. That's one thing. But somehow, something changed in the year 2000 where all markets around the world became for the most part, in sync. That is an anomaly that doesn't occur and is very, very odd. So anyway, after the year 2000, I'm finding a lot of these trends occurring. Now, look at this, the highest fifth mean income in 2016 dollars. It always goes up, okay? The rich get richer. That's the way it works. And ultimately, what happens is that asset prices rise. That's why I suggested in my first book that you need to in invest in assets. Do not keep your money in the bank. It's very dangerous. You want to invest in assets. Now, we can decide left and right and back and forth about what the best assets are. I just think that your money is better kept in assets, particularly ones that pay you passively. A passive investment, in my opinion, is the best way to do it. Look, if you have an example, let's say you have $1,000 a month in expenses, 
all right? And you work every month and you get paid $1,200, let's say, okay? So you have $200 left over and maybe that's your savings, maybe that's, you know, this or that you have to pay. Well, that's all great. But what if you had assets, right? And they were paying you $1,000 a month. Maybe you had a little a house that you bought or, or maybe, you know, whatever it might be, even a a stock that has dividends, you take those dividend money and that would be able to, let's say, pay all your expenses. Okay, let's just dream for a moment. And so that would be an amazing thing. You wouldn't need to do your nine to five job anymore. And that's what a lot of these people are doing. At the same time, when you have assets, generally, depends on where you live, generally, you're taxed at a lower bracket. And I think that's something that people don't realize how beneficial that is. And that's why the rich get richer. They know how to game the system properly, legally. The wage share. Poor households live off their paychecks. The wealthiest have other sources of income too. Again, more of what I was talking about here. The top 10%, I mean, it's pretty obvious. They've got all the income. They've got all the businesses. They've just, they're just making everything, right? But the average individual, particularly those on the bottom, are not able to do that because they're literally scrambling. They can barely afford any of their bills, let alone being able to invest. And that's really a lot of the people that I like to speak to as well. Trying to get people to understand that we need to break free of the mold to understand, you know, there are ways today you don't really need to put money in to be able to make money. You may have to give up time and energy and ideas, but there are ways to produce an income, maybe a small one at first, without having any money to begin with. But it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of um, dedication, that's for sure. If you're already in the top 10%, you know, maybe something was handed to you along the way and that's, you know, good for them. But those in the middle class, those in the um, lower lower income uh, individuals, you know, I definitely feel for you, that's for sure. This can be turned around, definitely. Stocking up, firms repurchased almost 50% more stock in 2010 to 2016 than in prior cycle. Well, that's very clear. I mean, I've talked about this before. You can see what's happening with stock buybacks. Now, yes, there was a run-up here, but over time, this seems to just be able to continue on and on. These companies have been doing this for years and years. You're noticing how that's happening. The stock buybacks, um, you know, it's just one example because you also have the quantitative easing that's happening. Either way, stocks will continue to get pushed up through all of these different methods. Last but not least, rising tides lift fewer boats. Income gains during the U.S. expansions have increasingly gone to the rich. Bottom 90% share of income gains is the yellow. And just look at this. Back in the day, you know, in the 40s and 50s, it was a much different situation. And you see where the trend is going. Very clear. Very, very clear. And so ultimately, I suggest that people try to look into assets, try to understand where their money is best kept. If they have even $5, where should it be kept? I talk about it a lot in my books. I mean, it's it's not so linear and it's um, multidimensional, of course, but... Be very, very concerned about the financial system. Know where to keep your money. Know how to spread it around, both geographically and and, uh, in a diversified way. I'll leave it at that. If you found the video informative, please give me a thumbs up. Last but not least, if you found this video informative, I know you will find my books, The Money GPS, and my newer release, Global Economic Collapse, even more informative. If you'd like to look through these books, you can do so. Amazon has that feature to do so. Its uh, Links are in the description below. Take care.